composer and graduate student here at Princeton University. Um, my specialty, one of the areas that I focus on as a composer is, I'd say, visual music. And that is uh, an investigation into how music and images interact, and there are a lot of different ways to do that. So of course you can imagine that uh, Pink Floyd was, uh, let's say, a very influential experience for me when I was younger. Um, so when I first began to consider a topic for this presentation, I decided to ask my friends and colleagues about their own personal experiences with Pink Floyd, and listening to their accounts, there's a story that showed up again and again. It's a story I'm sure we've all heard many times before. It's the one that's, uh, where someone starts, so I turned out the lights, I laid on my back, I closed my eyes, and I listened to the dark side of the moon. Um, I happened to Google that phrase, close my eyes and listen to the dark side of the moon, and I found a couple million results. The story usually goes on to talk about the feeling of being enveloped in the sounds with vivid imagery running through the mind's eye. And I have to admit, as cliche as it may be, I do relate to this story. I too had that same experience. As a teenager, I loved listening carefully to the album with headphones and feeling the music construct a space around me, noticing how sounds could appear from a distance, whiz past me, or float away. So today I'd like to talk about what makes Pink Floyd's music so receptive to imagery and why it is such a rewarding experience to turn out the lights, lie on your back, close your eyes, and visualize while listening to Pink, uh, Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. So I'm going to talk about the subject of sonic images. Okay. I'm going to talk about these internal visualizations we notice while we listen to the music. And I will identify aspects of Pink Floyd's music and visual identity that provide the ideal conditions for conjuring vivid sonic images. But first, I would like to present a very brief overview of Pink Floyd's career to demonstrate how intimately connected images are to the music and the identity of the band. So unlike most bands, the visual identity of Pink Floyd wasn't based on the pictures of the band. In my own experience, I actually didn't know what they looked like for years after owning their albums. Instead of emphasizing images of their faces or of the band playing their instruments, they used other images to substitute for the band, images that I call visual surrogates. These are symbolic images which offer opportunity for subjective interpretation. So I'd like to break down Pink Floyd's visual surrogacy into uh, four categories. And those are live shows, album art, film, and audience-generated visuals. So starting with live shows, from the very early live shows, we're talking in the 60s at the UFO Club in London, the band created visual surrogates by featuring uh, light shows. These are projections strobe lights, and shadows. Richard Wright confirmed the importance of these effects over the individual band members when he confessed, the people came to hear the music and see the show, not to see us as personalities jumping around on stage. Even in the UFO days, they came for the experience of the lights plus the music. Of course, we all know, oh, I have another picture of these guys, so you can see, yeah, lots of shadows and the iconic psychedelic look. Um, over the course uh, of the career, we all know that these shows developed into extravagant live theatrical events with props, pyrotechnics, synchronized films, and cutting-edge laser technology. Perhaps the clearest example of visual surrogacy during a live concert was the performance, the live performance of The Wall, where they literally built a wall on stage separating the band from the audience. But while the band was obscure, giant props and projections provided the other visual surrogates. Another example can be found in the feature film version of The Wall, directed by Alan Parker. The band is nowhere to be seen in the film, though they are present, of course, in the soundtrack. These are actors, animations, uh, there are actors, animations, and cinematic effects, all of which produce iconic surrogate images associated with the band's larger identity.
So let's watch just a very short animation from the wall to get a, a little bit of a sense of another way that the band chose to represent their, their visual identity. It's just about a minute. Album covers. There's really only one exception to the rule of very, uh, visual surrogacy where the band chose to show themselves, and that's right in the center there. The Piper at the da Gates of Dawn. It happened to also be their first album before they fully developed their identity. Pink Floyd collaborated with the English design group Hypnosis, spelled H-I-P-G-N-O-S-I-S, to produce some of the most iconic images in all popular, mu popular music. Once again, these images are symbolic, and they do not feature the band members. Finally, it is important to note the impact that this culture of surrogate imagery had on the fans. By making the band's imagery more symbolic and open to interpretation, it allowed audiences to engage with the identity of the band, so much so that their own contributions became part of the identity of the band itself. Examples of this include the Laser Spectacular, um, which is independently produced uh, by many different uh, production companies uh, performed in local planetariums. You probably had some experience with that. Um, the Wizard of Oz. And I think a, another uh, interesting example is Tattoo Art. Uh, I find tattoos to be an illuminating, illuminating sample set of images related to Pink Floyd. And it's also a revealing comparison you can try at home if you search for Google images of other tattoos, of tattoos fired by other major bands, like the Beatles or the Rolling Stones. Um, I think you'll find that nothing compares to the breadth of results you'll find if you search Pink Floyd. Uh, so looking at these examples, it is clear that Pink Floyd's visual identity is layered and intriguing. But what is most important is that the visuals are abstract enough that it both inspires fans while inviting creative interpretation. By the band excluding themselves from their, in their visual identity and embracing a symbolic visual identity, fans were allowed to project their own thoughts and feelings and imagery on the band. The audience itself became a surrogate. This aesthetic of ambiguous identity continues into the music as well, and that leads me to sonic images. So what exactly are sonic images? I'm going to give a, a, a very simple definition. Sonic images are mental representations motivated by sonic stimuli. So when do they occur? Well, in theory, sonic images are produced when listening to an acousmatic sound, and that's, that's a, a word to describe a sound where the sound source is not visible. So sound one hears without seeing its cause. In a sense, sonic images are effectively surrogates 
for sounds that have no accompanying visuals. We can relate images to all types of sounds, but there's a certain aesthetic of music that will emphasize sonic images more than others. Why is some music better at producing interesting sonic images? So let's consider and answer this, this question while we listen to the opening track, Speak to Me from Dark Side of the Moon. From this, I think we can derive a variety of sonic images, and I think it will offer clues for the conditions that create interesting sonic images. It turns out that when we hear a sound, and a sound source is unseen, so if it is an acousmatic sound, our most immediate sonic image is the recreation of what we believe to be the source. So when we hear a recording of a dog bark, we're going to imagine an image of a dog. When we hear a guitar strum, we can imagine an image of a guitar. Suffice it to say, these are not very interesting sonic images. What makes an interesting sonic image is when there is some ambiguity. This stimulates the imagination, of course. For example, when we hear sounds presented in a strange context, like a bodiless, quickly approaching scream, or when we hear an unfamiliar instrument, like the sound of a heavily processed synthesizer. These are the conditions when the sonic images are not literal, and as a result, they become more interesting. This level of abstraction begins to draw attention to our sonic images. And this is where we find the music in Floyd. So all this begs a fairly obvious question. What do sonic images look like if one is not imagining the band or the instrument? Is there any logic to sonic images? Well, there are well-documented studies that show a large amount of agreement between qualities of sounds and the sonic images they produce. For instance, Sounds are linked to gesture. This has been tested through sound tracing studies where subjects spontaneously draw gestures to represent the music they hear. A large amount of agreement has been documented, especially in pitch contour and dynamic patterns. This may not be surprising when we consider the common metaphors used to describe some formal qualities of music. We take for granted that music goes somewhere, such as a rising melodic line where an interval moves by step or by leap. This level of agreement between sonic, uh, sound and sonic, sonic images may be more than you think. And here are some other examples. Frequency and brightness. So if you have two images here, one that's bright and one that's dark, and you have to associate frequency to it, and I said you have high frequency and low frequency, so if you hear two sounds, something like this. Which one will you associate with which color? You don't need to answer me right now, but I can tell you. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of mind reading, right? Uh, the, the first pitch you associated with the bright yellow color, am I right? No? Get out of here. Uh, so, so yeah, so this is something that is well documented. Uh, it is very likely that you will associate high frequency to a brighter color. The same is true of uh, frequency and vertical space. So um, if I give you those, uh, this time let's, let's get some proof in the room. Uh, with your right arm, so everybody find your right arm. <laughs> uh, you can point to the first pitch that I make, and it could be anywhere in the room. And with your left arm, you, pitch the, you point to the second pitch that I make. Everybody close your eyes, ready? First pitch. Second pitch. 
Now hold your arms where they are, open your eyes. <laughs> Do we have a, a general level of agreement here? Okay, what we call high pitches, high pitches, and low pitches, low pitches. <laughs> we naturally associate pitch to vertical space. Here's another one I like. I don't know if you've uh, come across these terms before, booba and kiki, or kiki and booba. I arrange them like that so I'm not really going to give preference to one over the other. But remember these two names, booba and kiki. Now, you have two shapes <laughs> that you have to name. <laughs> How many people think that the, the pointy one is kiki? <laughs> All right, I'd say that's roughly 90%. That's what we're going for. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is an association between sound and timbre. Yet another agreement of sonic images. Uh, there are others. There are um, volume and size, noise and texture, uh, and structural uh, agreements, such as continuity and discontinuity. Um, but. The final example that I wanted to keep, uh, because I think that it's one of the most effective in generating vivid sonic images, it, and it's highly pertinent to this event if you were here yesterday to hear the surround sound, and that is the, uh, the proximity of a sound and its relation to a sonic image. If we hear a sound to our left, our sonic image will occur in that same place. This phenomenon can be used to conjure traveling sonic images, and even create a sonic architecture in which sonic images can be placed. The perceptual phenomenon has also been exploited, exploited by jet pilots. I'm not sure if you've heard of this, but sounds in a pilot's helmet indicating the location of other jets are placed in three-dimensional space so a pilot can tell um, if a threat is behind them just from the sound. So here's my list of what I believe to be the ideal conditions required to encourage vivid sonic images. Acousmatic sound, so this is a sound where the, the source remains unseen. Sounds, number two, sounds with a source or instrument that is difficult to identify. So it's, it's processed or it's presented out of context, so our immediate sonic image is not just the literal one, the literal source. Three, an aesthetic placement of sound in deep and varied sound space. This uh, usually occurs in the mixing and recording um, phase. Four, a culture that emphasizes concentrated listening. Maybe one that would tell a story of closing your eyes first. And five, a culture that de-emphasizes personality, fashion, or anything that generates images of people producing the sounds. The Dark Side of the Moon incorporates all of these to create conditions for rich sonic imagery. I think that um, all of, just about every track, I would, I would say these conditions are present to varying degrees, but they're all present. And the music and culture surrounding Pink Floyd evoke sonic images. Visual surrogacy, which invites the audience into a creative and interpretive mindset, and the ambiguous acousmatic music combined to create an invite, inviting environment for creating your own sonic images. So I want to end this presentation with a last example from Dark Side of the Moon, an excerpt from the track On the Run, um, which features sound effects, percussion, and DCS3 synthesizer. And for me, this has always been one of the most, um, the tracks that produce the most vivid sonic images. So feel free to close your eyes as you listen and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs>